Funding for this program was provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. It's not an exaggeration to apply the word classic to the work of children's author and illustrator William Joyce. I love his work. It tells a story. But nothing will replace in my heart George Shrinks and A Day with Wilbur Robinson and Dinosaur Bob. And it's like watching a movie. William Joyce wrote his first book when he was in the second grade in his hometown of Shreveport. Years later, the Louisiana legend still finds the same excitement in the creative process. Only today, he works in the state-of-the-art studio he designed himself. He even designed much of the furniture. The seeds of this limitless creativity took root a long time ago. I realized very soon into having Bill in this class that he was exceptional and uh, exceptionally talented. And furthermore, the other children in the class realized it as well. They say, oh, Bill, draw this for me, draw this for me. You know, and come see what Bill is doing. What Bill was doing was building the foundation of an amazing career. He's published many of the best-loved books of contemporary children's literature, including George Shrinks, Roly Poly Oli, and Dinosaur Bob. And he's branched out into the field of animation with great success. George Shrinks is a favorite on PBS, and he's done this without compromising the unique quality of his work. He said the people that are interested in doing the kind of work I'm doing are more particular about that fine point than sometimes even I am. And he said, I surrounded myself with the people who have quality in their minds and, and continue to keep that going. He is uh, talented in so many ways, and he is such a loyal, good friend. Everyone that has ever been a friend to, with Bill Joyce, going back to elementary school, to high school, these are still his very best friends. And even with international success, Bill Joyce and family still call Shreveport home. Louisiana is fortunate to have him because he could write his own ticket to any place in the country and has, I'm sure, had many offers to go other places and uh, has chosen to stay in Shreveport and uh, make this his home. From creating characters for Pixar's Toy Story to creating his own production company, Moonbot Studios, William Joyce already has a legacy anyone would be proud of. But everyone that knows this Louisiana legend says his best days are still to come. Hello, I'm Beth Courtney. Welcome to this edition of Louisiana Legends. I am here in Shreveport, Louisiana with an outstanding legend from my part of the state, I would say. Bill Joyce, welcome. We're Thank so you. glad to have this conversation with you. You are uh, obviously artist, author, illustrator, filmmaker, a composer as well, a man of many <laughs> talents. Uh, uh, um, not much of a composer. <laughs> I only did one theme song for a TV show, but well, <laughs> anyway. We are here in your uh, new facility, Moonbots. Um, why Moonbots? Uh, Moonbot Studios, it's named after a character in a short film that we did a few years ago uh, about the man in the moon, and I'm doing a series of books based on that subject now, and it's uh, uh, also going to be a feature film at DreamWorks. So we've taken this little Moonbot character that we liked a lot and made him our, our mascot. Well, you um, evidently, someone said uh, about you earlier that you were born with a pencil or something in your That's what my hand. parents said, that I was born with a pencil in my hand. Which what, now, why little, did they say that? Because I was drawing evidently from day one, and, um, and there's evidence to back that up to a degree. <laughs> but uh, I always thought that was... Uh, of course they're exaggerating. We're Irish and Southern, so, you know. Exaggeration is part of your DNA. It's <laughs> how we get through the day. And, uh, but yeah, I was, uh, I've been drawing all my life. Well, I understand you've been telling stories all your life, and your first actual full-length, I guess, story was the fourth grade. And what was the subject matter? I, it got you sent to the principal's office, as I recall. It was a formative experience, yes. It was, uh, 
it was it was a kind of see what kid could make the the best kids story you know and uh, I've been thinking about this one for a while and it was called Billy's Booger and it was a autobiographical piece <laughs> about a kid who was bad at math a kid named Billy and um, that was the autobiographical part then the fiction part comes in uh, Billy gets hit in the head by a meteorite and his boogers get superpowers and are very good at math and um, and so his nose Billy's nose is their secret fortress stronghold and so whenever they go out to fight crime they Billy just sort of sneezes and out they come and then then back up into Billy's nose they go <laughs> and uh, when they're gonna hide out and you know it like all superheroes it was a secret you know nobody knew that the super boogers lived in Billy's nose and uh, but these guys were able to help Billy out with his math homework uh, as well as fighting crime and it was done all in green crayon as a thematic sort of uh, choice and um, and I didn't win the prize and, and in fact I got called to the to the principal's office and I learned something that day that it was it was it was interesting that the, my, my, my peers liked the story the grown-ups got upset uh, but it got a lot of attention so from then on it, I found that uh, being a provocateur even at fourth grade level can sometimes be a, a nice path <laughs> well certainly um, childhood imagination is a wonderful thing and it's something that you even have, when boogers are involved even when boogers are involved I, uh, I, I would suppose though that uh, we as we get older you're that imagination can be stamped out a little bit do you is that what you're trying to still hold on to the childhood dreams well you know childhood dreams are a double-edged sword because a lot of times they're nightmarish as well which is also fun I mean if you ever want to hear a really ghoulish gory story you know talk to a first grader and ask him to just make up something on the spot <laughs> a lot of times you'll get some of the most horrifying stuff you've ever heard um, but yeah I mean there's a famous story about childhood imagination and how it gets eroded. Um, the, the head of children's uh, publishing at Harper and Row at the time it was called, uh, would go into schools and ask a bunch of five-year-olds, how many of you know how to draw? And everybody would raise their hand. How many of you know how to sing? Everybody would raise their hand. How many of you know how to tell a story? Everybody would raise their hand. And then she would go in in the second grade and ask the same questions. and like half the kids would raise their hands and then she'd go in in fifth grade and ask that question and only one or two people would raise their hands and she's like so what are we doing wrong that these kids are unlearning you know these basic things that we that they used to be able to do so something that goes on in the way you know you raise kids or childhood or something we take some of the fun out of it or some of the inventiveness out of it and uh I don't know if it was economic. I don't know if people thought there's no way you could ever make a job, get make mm -hmm. money doing mm -hmm. that, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly that was my parents' concern when, you know, I said I wanted to be an artist and tell stories or make up stories. They were like, fine, great, we want you to do what you want to do, but you're going to be poor your entire life, so marry someone who makes a living. And, um, but, you know, then I was able to grow up and make a living at it. And I think that the tables have, have turned a lot since I was a kid that, uh, there's a real need for storytellers and we've become so much of a storytelling media driven society and that's growing exponentially as, as, as all the, uh, the new technologies are coming into play. So it's, it's something viable now that you can say, do well, this. The creative class and, and mm -hmm. it's become economic development. Everybody's absolutely. talking, absolutely. absolutely. Huh? And these kids are so <coughs> in tune to it. I mean, and they're so, I mean, we all sort of grew up with this uh, bunch of stories. I mean, like when I was a kid, television had, you know, first come into play. And so there was this Scheherazade, basically, in your living room that was telling you all these amazing stories all day, every day. So we were, or my generation was exposed to all this great stuff from the past. I mean, I was Flash watching, Gordon. Flash Gordon, stuff, th things that my dad and my granddad had seen, Tarzan movies old Warner Brothers cartoons, just the Mickey Mouse show, just this amazing, you know, like banquet of great old stuff. So growing up in that, that time, you got kind of a sense of fantastic narrative and possibilities, and, and kids now have even more of that. 
So they're, they're, they're sort of narrative savvy in a way, and they have a sense of, an innate sense from, of how to tell a story and a sense of imagination that knows much fewer bounds than, than, than my generation did. So they're right at this perfect point when the idea of being a storyteller or an artist or an animator, it's a perfect time because it's, there's a call for more and more of that. You also uh, were nurtured by your family by the fact that they, you said they were, what, screwballs, eccentric? Well, aren't many Southern families? Yes, probably. T tell us about your family growing up. It's, it's easy to say, yes, I grew up in an eccentric household, but I, as I've traveled the world, I found that people are eccentric everywhere. So uh, we don't have a, we don't have like a monopoly on that. We just have our own distinct flavor of it here. But yeah, they were interesting people and an uncle who said he was an alien? Oh yes, he was quite convincing in that, in that he was, he, you know, he's like, he was almost seven feet tall, so he had a certain, you know, like presence. And he always told stories without any sense of awe and wonder. It was all very matter of fact. So, you know, he's like, yes, I'm from another planet, and I'm, you know, I've come <laughs> here, and, and I like it here, and I think it's an interesting place. And, you know, as a little kid, you're like, why would he make this up? You know, he's a grown up. They don't, you know, and he's not doing that kind of wink, wink, nudge, nudge, you know, kind of thing. It was very matter of fact. But he convinced us of many different things as well. He you know, convinced us that he had a mummy. He convinced us there was a guy that lived in the attic called Rawhead and Bloody Bones. And if we went up in the attic looking for Christmas presents, uh, he would, Rawhead and Bloody Bones would get us. And, you know, all kinds of kind of gruesome, <laughs> great gothic stuff. But we were all very creative, my, my sisters and my cousins, and our parents were not. And they were like, what? Where did this come from? What, <laughs> what strange anomaly has, has visited us? And, because uh, they're, so, I mean, they're really country people. And, and my dad was like the first one to go to college. And, uh, but on this these kids are into you know opera and theater and photography and painting and writing and so and I was the youngest so I was like privy to all the things that they had been bringing back as they went away to college and stuff so and you went away to college at uh, SMU yes I did when my father told me that I could go anywhere but LSU <laughs> I see I see well he's very adamant about so, so you went uh, one state over on a whim on a whim. Yeah. I heard they had a film school and an art school, and I was like, oh, those are the two things I'm interested in. And uh, without ever actually visiting the campus or finding out if, in fact, that was true, that they had both those things, away I went to, uh, to SMU. And so you ended up graduating, actually, in yeah. film. Yep. Uh, and um, so when your apps, actually, your first book was what? The first book, besides Bailey's Booger. Which is going to be a book, by the way. Oh, it's coming now. back. Yeah, yeah, we're working on it now. The first book that was published was called Tammy and the Gigantic Fish. And I did not write it. I illustrated it. And I got the um, contract to do that the week I got out of school, out of college. And I went up to New York and, with the help of a friend, um, got interviews at the different publishing houses and Harper Collins. You know, they were called Harper Row then. Uh, they were my first interview and they gave me a contract on the spot. I was kind of stunned. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it was a little black and white book, cute little thing. And uh, it did well enough. And they, that's kind of where I got my sort of apprenticeship. I mean, I didn't know how many pages a picture book was supposed to have. I didn't know any of the technical aspects of doing this. And, but in those days in publishing, uh, they really treated young authors with a sort of um, paternal quality. They, they taught me how publishing worked. They taught me, you know, how a picture books should should work. And so I had, you know, four or five years where they just nurtured me very much. And, uh, and then my book started to do well. Your your um, illustration, your style is is feels so. It feels very nostalgic and 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 comfortable for me. I mean, it feels it's warm. It draws you in. What Good. what about what are is this intentional? Yeah, it's very intentional. There's sort of a there's a willful nostalgic quality to, to my stuff because, you know, I grew up in this time, like I said, when TV was was first in everybody's household, and it was very intoxicating to watch these old old movies and, and cartoons because they weren't from, you know, 
when I was a kid, they were from an earlier time when, as, as I describe it, when men wore hats and women wore gloves and cars were round and picket fences were everywhere. And so it was sort of an idealized past that I was seeing in a lot of these stories. And it seemed, it had a nice once upon a time quality, you know, not like ancient once upon a time, not like Grimm's fairy tale, but it felt far enough removed from every day that it felt like fantastic things could happen in that time. And since a lot of the movies I was watching, fantastic things did happen in those, like flying saucers would come <laughs> cruising in and King Kong was running around right. in New York. and and. So they said sort of George Shrinks, which is one of your famous books and became a PBS series. Um, it does, it's sort of an homage to um, small creatures, size. Yeah. Well, it was like, Taking King Kong in reverse, George is very small, Kong was very big, and uh, and that's just such an, an alluring thing. It, it size is so it matters to kids. Like you know, nothing's their size, and you know, doorknobs, everything's higher than 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 they can really you know deal with. And and so I just reversed it. George gets little, and there's even stuff in the book, and it's in a couple of episodes of the show where he has. Uh, Kong-like adventures with the family cat that's trying to consume him, and uh, <laughs> so he's flying around the cat in his little airplane, uh, flying car airplane, and uh, in one of the episodes of the show, we did a shot-for-shot -shot parody of King Kong, and um, and I set it in the 1950s, so it's sort of like, it's like Leave It to Beaver meets The Incredible Shrinking Man with King Kong thrown in, and a little bit of like MGM musicals too. That's wonderful. You know, uh, you've also been a consultant, uh, obviously, out in Hollywood, as you continue now to do a variety mm -hmm. of things. Now, tell me your relationship with Disney uh, Studios. You, you were involved with, now, were you, you were involved in the design of some of the toys for Toy Story? Sure. Um, you know, it's, it's been a long process working with d all the different studios, really, for me out mm -hmm. there. Um, it, before, I had a book that was about to come out called... Uh, Day of Wilbur, a Day with Wilbur Robinson, and it got optioned by Disney as a film like before it came out in 1990, and it finally was released about three, four years ago as Meet the Robinsons. And at the same time I, that that was happening, I got a call from John Lasseter, the, the head of Pixar, which at the time only had 12 employees, and he was like, we really like your stuff, and we'd like to pitch one of your books, uh, Dinosaur Bob, as our first feature film, along with this other uh, story we have about a toy and I'm like cool that'd be great and but send me your stuff I, I want to see what your stuff looks like and so he sent me their short films which were exquisite they'd already won a couple of uh, short film Oscars at that point and in computer animation it was the first time I had seen computer animation and I was like blown away I was like even in those primitive days it was like this is what I've been waiting for uh, as far as animation goes and hand-drawn animation had fallen in decline and, excuse me, um, this seemed like an exciting new way to make a film. So uh, it turns out Jeffrey Katzenberg, the head of Disney, said, no, we don't want to do the dinosaur one because we have another dinosaur story in development. We'll do the toy one. And, but John wanted me to work on the toy one, which became Toy Story. So, yeah, I worked on that from the earliest days. Did you help? choose those toys or did you or you just know, the design of Woody and all of that the design of Woody and Buzz and the dinosaur and the little three-eyed alien guys and a whole bunch of the characters and, and kind of worked uh, giving story inspiration and stuff it was it was a wonderful process and then I did the same thing on uh, on uh, Bugs Life and but during that all these other opportunities started coming up for me um, in the television motion picture business so I started doing television series for Disney and called Rolly Polioli and then one for PBS called George Shrinks based on my books and then produced and designed um, a feature film for Fox called Robots that was computer animation and I have an upcoming film with them called uh, The Leaf Men which is based on one of my books and it, it was a play that you guys showed. We did PBS. indeed on PBS. And then Jeffrey Katzenberg who at the all those years ago who turned down Dinosaur Bob as the first computer animated feature film. He and I are now working together at DreamWorks on uh, a story called The Guardians, which is, has my moon bot in it and um, is about uh, what I call the guardians of childhood, the, the, the great myths of childhood. Um, Santa Claus, a tooth fairy, Sandman, 
Easter Bunny and Man in the Moon are like all pals and hang out together and fight the boogeyman uh, and keep, oh you know, uh, they're sort of like Justice League of America, but for kids or little kids. And they have, you know, these great gigantic uh, empires and going concerns to do the thing that they do. And, and so they're constantly involved in this global struggle against the Against the bad retailers? Or <laughs> <laughs> well, I, we hint from time to time that the boogeyman controls all the retailers and has somehow weakened Christmas or something like that. But anyway, so now I'm working on, on that, yeah. So it's, it all comes around. Uh, the film community, is, in a strange way, is, is actually pretty small. And so I've ended up working with a lot of interesting and fascinating people. I worked with Francis Coppola in the early days of... At Pixar with John, and um, and then in the early days of Blue Sky, the guys who did um, um, Ice Age, you know, we by now we'll, they'll be doing Leaf Man, and that'll be our second film together. So it's been really fun to be in this, the beginnings of that industry. And you've been doing this, and you still live in Louisiana. You live in Shreveport. Yeah. Now, why? Tell us why, because you could live anywhere. Um, it was a good place to raise our kids. Was basically, mm -hmm. and we're from here. It's home and I like Louisiana and it felt and still feels exotic to be from here and work out there mm -hmm. and it seemed like in some ways the more tenacious I was about staying here the more they wanted to use me out there you know the more I said no the more they wanted me to say yes so you know that weird way that psychology can sometimes work in your favor when you're being hard-headed it's uh I think it's helped, actually. Well, uh, I understand that you traditionally around Halloween would put all sorts of decorations around your house. Yeah. That it was the famous place to come in Shreveport, Louisiana, <laughs> etc. I actually drove past your house once. I think it had giant spiders. Yeah, it did. It, did it? Definitely. Yeah. yeah so Thirty foot spider out front. Do sure. the, ch the children expect a lot from you? <laughs> well, they're not children anymore, so that, that's changed a bit. But yeah, it, I mean, we have like a hundred at least a hundred skeletons and a 30-foot spider and an unbelievable amount of other gothic uh, ephemera and um, the party yes it takes about a month to set up for and I think there's a hundred smoke machines and <laughs> there's so much stuff going on and uh, I think of it as like Mm, the Great Gatsby by way of Martha Stewart with Dracula thrown in. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Actually, Martha Stewart came down for the party one year and did a, a piece on it on her show. So, oh. you know, and we have a film of her and my wife uh, pretending to hobby up some Halloween decorations, <laughs> which Elizabeth never actually did any of that herself. <laughs> well, uh, Elizabeth uh, came down when we honored you as a Louisiana legend, right. and it was just a, a beautiful occasion. And... Uh, uh, we love the fact that you are also now exposing your creativity and imagination and creating this industry here. Tell, tell us a little bit more about how many people are employed and what you hope to have happen in the future. Since Louisiana has taken the lead in these tax initiatives, uh, it's really been great for what I do. And uh, bringing the film industry to Louisiana has been exciting and, and a real feat. I mean, the state should be proud of having uh, done this and pulled this off. And, you know, now that all these other states are trying to compete with us and imitate us, I mean, we still have an allure that uh, keeps us busy. But the idea of starting a studio, an animation studio here, would have been impossible without that. And, you know, it seemed like the next uh, most natural progression in, in what I was doing. Instead of having to travel to do animation, why not do it here? Our, our first film, it's a short, uh, and it's kind of an amalgamation of animation styles. It's like we built miniature sets, but the characters are all computer generated, and we place them in the miniature sets and blend the whole thing, and they, and they end up looking like they're a, a whole new kind of animation in a way. But it's, a, it's sort of based on a lot of different things, like Hurricane Katrina, and so got me all like thinking about the power of stories and how necessary they are and what would happen if everybody's story got blown away in a storm. I mean we think of ourselves as sort of an idea factory more than anything else and not just a, a, a motion picture studio like 
the way things are changing, I mean, ideas can go across so many different platforms. So we're thinking of our things as books and games and apps and movies and TV shows and whatever else comes up. We're adapting our ideas, our stories to those mediums as they show up. Well, Bill Joyce, thank you for being with us today and having thank a little you. conversation. I hope to check in with you to see what else exciting is happening here. Well, you know, when we have our first movie premiere, we'll call you up. Thank you. I'll hold you to that. And thank you all for joining us on Louisiana Legends. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org. Funding for this program was provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting.